So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the FIW, uh, FIW Trade Talks. Today we are discussing the topic about the economic dividend of competitiveness. The FIW Trade Talks received generous financial support from the Austrian Ministry of Labor and Economy, for which we are very grateful. My name is Harald Oberhofer, and I'm your host of the FIW Trade Talk today. Now, as, as usual, a disclaimer before starting, just very briefly, I would like to remind you on how this trade talk is structured. So the trade talk uh, starts with a 15 to 20 minutes input of our guest. And after that, we will have a, a general discussion, which will last about 40 minutes. We would not want to, to, to stop later than five o'clock Viennese time. So the whole trade talk should not last longer than one hour. You can participate in the discussion by posting your questions and comments into the Q&A section here in the Zoom call, which you find at the bottom of this Zoom, um, at, of Zoom uh, here. Uh, I would highly encourage you to, to participate in the discussion, so please feel free to drop your questions and comments. At any point in time, I will pick up these questions and bring them in, into our discussion. Now, and uh, finally, after the seminar, we will, or, or the, the trade talk, uh, we will send you a very short feedback questionnaire, and we will be very happy if you could give us feedback on the FIW trade talk series. Now, uh, having said that, I would like to move on to our topic of today. So with this, I would uh, uh, like to turn to our guest. I'm delighted to welcome Frederick Erickson, who will speak on the economic dividend of competitiveness. Frederick is director and co-founder of the European Center for International Political Economy, ECP, a world economy think tank located in Brussels. ECP has been established in 2006. The Financial Times has ranked Frederick Erickson as one of Brussels' 30 most influential people, and so we are very delighted to hear from a very influential person at the European level on the topic I just mentioned. Uh, if I'm not mistaken with my internet uh, search, then Frederick studied at the University of Oxford, the London School of Economics, and Uppsala University. He is author of several books and studies in the fields of international economics, economic policy, and very broadly defined regulatory affairs, including topics like welfare reforms, healthcare, or competition policy. His latest book, co-authored with Björn Weigel, uh, is called The Innovation Illusion, How So Little Is Created by So Many Working So Hard, and has been published by Yale University Press. His research interests cover international economics, European relations with Asia and North America, trade and regulatory policy, and also philosophy and technological change. Frederick just uh, told me uh, in our meeting before this talk that he is currently working on a new book where he's working on the topic of technological change. And he also has another book, which is called, which is new, is his next book is called Saving Liberalism for the 21st Century. Um, is about and it's about challenges from populism and other ideas uh, to the open society. Now, uh, having said all of that, um, I would uh, like to hand over to you, Frederick. Thank you very much for being with us today. The floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, Harald, for inviting me uh, to participate in in this series and to have a conversation with you um, about. Um, at least topics that I find interesting. I'm not too sure you do, but uh, but but um, I I do find them interesting, and I enjoy uh, uh, the form of the conversation. So I should try to keep my introduction short as well, and um, and more have sort of an interaction between us. Let me also start with an apology. Uh, this is my first week back from holiday. Uh, um, I'm not back in the office, and I promised Harald that I was going to send a PowerPoint presentation at the beginning of the week, but I didn't have to. I didn't have time to. Uh, do the spelling check, which I can see right now when I'm looking at the first page of my PowerPoint presentation, where there is a, a, a spelling error in trade talks. Um, hopefully, it's not, there's not many other spelling mistakes, but I'm, I, I can't vouch for that for the time being. All right, so I'm going to share with you a couple of thoughts about competitiveness, the concept of competitiveness, how I think about it, and perhaps the 
the perils uh, also that lie in the broader field of competitiveness itself and uh, why we need to be careful to frame the conversation to be about um, constructive topics that we actually can do things about and that's going to help us to shape uh, uh, an economic development that that we'd like to see so i mean you all probably know um um how the concept of competitiveness have been uh, approached by different schools of thought and economics over the years um I belong to um, sort of a, a, a school of thought um, associated with Paul Krugman and his book Pop Internationalism, which uh, took a pretty um, ridiculed view of competitiveness for quite some time, um, not really thinking that it's a concept itself which is defined in, uh, in ways that makes it easy to integrate into a framework of economic analysis that work with um, basic economic principles as well as with uh, uh, the usual type of, of approaches we do take when we try to respond to pressing issues of um, economic development. Um, one peril, of course, is that you quite easily fall into the trap of zero-sum thinking um, if you apply strict framework of competitiveness that you think it's about benefiting yourself or your own economy at the expense of uh, anyone else, that you easily uh, fall into also economic concepts, which is um, difficult to square with how a modern economy is structured and how it operates, both what type of endowments that are important and what type of linkages that you're going to find between different economic operators in different economic locales. So this is something that we've struggled with as we've done a couple of uh, quite many papers now on the topic of competitiveness and, and thinking about how to anchor it in the EU framework and, and why it's important for the EU. Um, at its core, it is analytically uh, a concept of trying to understand your own performance vis-a-vis -vis other uh, uh, other actors, and that can be, of course, other countries or other regions, or it could be other companies or other individuals. And, and within that analytical approach, I think it's important that we get the emphasis right to what what's, uh, matters here. Um, we are now again um, in um, a time when um, different aspects of economic power and different geopolitical aspects of economic policy are quickly again resurfacing and having an influence in the way that policymakers think about what is what is important to do. Um, you may remember an old Jacob Weiner uh, paper uh, on power versus plenty that came out uh, a few years after the Second World War. Um, where he be began sort of a, a, a type of analysis around these concepts. He called it power versus plenty, uh, and basically asking questions about what's the purpose of economic policy? Is it to maximize prosperity or is it to maximize power? Uh, Weiner, of course, um, is famous for basically saying that there is not necessarily a conflict between those concepts and um, and that um, looking back at 17th and 18th century um, economic thinking to some extent 19th, 19th century economic thinking as well making the point that um, these uh, targets or these objectives can be interchangeable uh, but it's basically the same type of policies sometimes that lead to them um, and of course, in that sense, taking um, uh, taking sort of more of a analytical conflict with other scholars who had treated, especially the school of mercantilism, uh, in a different way um, in the beginning of twentieth century when they were analysing what that system was about. Weiner was, of course, he was writing um, uh, in the beginning of uh, the Cold War uh, after the Second World War and was thinking about U.S. foreign policy. That was his paper was about. Uh, it was not an economics paper, it was a strategic paper. 
And, and he's making, of course, the point in that paper that given how things are evolving, uh, there is going to be a premium uh, on policies that may not maximize plenty, that may not lead to more prosperity, but they are still very much important in order to have the economic power that will be necessary in order to deal with different type of challenges that America and by extension, um, the West was going to be confronted with over that period of time. And it's pretty much that type of thinking that we can detect uh, in high quarters also right now, which is that there has been sort of an underlying assumption for quite some time that not necessarily maximizing prosperity, but at least uh, organizing policies in order to generate more prosperity has been paramount in, in the thinking of, of economic policy. But we're now back again into thinking about how that concept should integrate with, uh, with uh, more challenges that arrive from geopolitics and from, from the fact that the world is changing and, and these changes may bring new problems um, that requires power in order to respond to them. So that's the sort of overarching framework, which I think is interesting to, to discuss. Um, and one can do that in different way. I think one starting point for it would be to, uh, to begin to organize the analysis in a way where we start to appreciate what type of factors and what type of, of patterns of economic behavior that may be folded into either the category of power or the category of plenty. And, and also to understand um, how these have changed over time. If you go back to the old Diviner paper in terms of, of economic resources, most people then were thinking about stuff like iron, steel, or um, raw materials that were necessary in order to sustain um, an industrial sector and to sustain uh, a machinery that also could generate armory and military equipment that could, could be used in, in the event of military conflicts. Um, the trade thinking back then was also pretty rudimentary in terms of how we understood integration dependencies and what type of, of trade linkages that generated uh, different type of economic values. If we were going to think about these issues today, and what we've been trying to do is, is we need to sort of take stock of different type of of, uh, of 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 different factors that could be sort of endowments, organization, or intensities on the trade side. Um, uh, looking at um, a region sharing global trade, trade and value added. Looking at dependency type of of factors. That's of course important. Uh, what perhaps is even more important, though, is to go into all these factors that didn't matter so much back in in in, in Jacob Weiner's time um, when we were thinking about these issues then. And I, if I'm going to point to one factor that's perhaps more important than anything else, it's about ideas. And it's about the generation of new ideas in a society and how they can be uh, used for economic purposes. And... That, of course, can be measured in different ways. We can go and go in and look at um, intellectual property. We can look at human capital. Um, we can look at research output and these type of indicators that uh, we have plenty of in order to understand the relative performance of one, one region vis-a-vis -vis the other. Equally important is to look at the, the, the use of these ideas in the economy, meaning innovation. Um, finding different indicators um, on churn, on technological intensities, on adoption rates, on what type of economic value that is generated on the back of new technologies um, that is being introduced. We can look at, at different um, uh, time indicators as well, for instance, understanding how long time it takes for different technologies to ripple through uh, organizations in different, in different economies. Markets. Um, uh, I'll come back to that later because I think it's something which is of increasing importance, um, and it's definitely increasing importance when we're thinking about the type of industrial policy that is popular to think about now, which is on creating national champions, favoring bigness, thinking that it's sort of scale of resources that um, that's going to define 
the ability of a company to stand up uh, uh, tall in in global uh, competition in the future. Um, but what I what my main point here would be sort of is to is to focus sort of on on specialization and the degree to which that market becomes specialized. And that, of course, also leads into the specialization of firms. And this this is something which we have the tools and economics to study in a in a what I think is 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 a quite a good way right now, and to understand how different economic regions compare with each other over time, and especially over the last 20, 30 years, say, when it comes to how good different firms have been uh, to specialize and what what that specialization is driven from and what type of consequences that specialization lead to in terms of of uh, size uh, global footprint etc and then of course there are other factors as well Instru infrastructure is one of them looking at uh, uh, geography trading routes looking at networks um, and other forms of infrastructure that is important in order to understand the ability to compete in the future. Having done all that, um, and I think it's it's intellectually a curious conversation to have around each and every, and there are plenty more than those I've listed here, um, when it comes to trying to understand important aspects of the relative economic performance of a region. Um, but a different approach to take when you look at policy, um, and this is also where we've sort of landed in a couple of papers that we've done, which is that, well, if there's something that is important, regardless if you think about power or you think about plenty, it is that you need to raise productivity growth, that the essence of uh, prosperity, of course, of long-term prosperity is very much driven by productivity growth. But even when you even when you fold this aspect into the concept of power and economic power, and you want to understand the role of economic power in, in, in different types of of patterns of change and perhaps even conflicts that we're going to have in the future. Raising productivity pro growth is probably the first uh, uh, target you should have if you want to make yourself more powerful. All right, um, so how do, we, how do we think about the EU um, in this perspective and thinking about long-term uh, developments of competitiveness and change. Um, there are lots of things that can be pointed to, but if I'm going to point to three, which I think is is uh, of importance and, and that we, uh, regardless where we're coming from or where we're going to end up, end up we, need to, we need to factor that into the analysis we have. One, of course, is about relative economic decline. Uh, that uh, Europe is has a shrinking share of global trade or global GDP or global population or whatever measure that you're taking. Um, there is nothing uh, surprising about this, um, as many other countries in the world uh, have grown richer. It basically means that Europe's share of, of uh, the global economic pie is going to shrink. Um, uh, the European Commission estimates that by next year, I think it is, the um, sort of 8 to 5 percent of all new global growth is going to be generated outside of the EU, and of course that that share is going to increase in the future, um, which of course points uh, 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 to a couple of difficult issues that we need to deal with. Um, um, if if sort of global if new global value generation is going to be substantially something that happens outside our own border, how do we need to position ourselves in order to be uh, to be uh, have the ability to uh, to benefit on on the back of that of that economic expansion? If you think about developments in the long term, and of course this is extraordinarily difficult, McKinsey have done a guesstimate which suggests that by 2050, EU is going to represent about 10% of global GDP. There are a few other guesstimates out there as well, and they're all coming into that region. Some may be a percentage point lower, one be one or two percentage points higher, but, but we're talking about a development where, where Europe's share of, of the economy is going to decline. I think it's important to think through also what that means in terms of a couple of more intermediary uh, indicators. I mean, it basically means that of all global educational expense, Europe's share is going to go down. Of all global expense on universities and R&D, Europe's share is going to go down. Of, of IP generation, of patents, of new graduates, Europe's share is going to go down. 
And, and it largely means that we are most likely presented with a development where we are going to become more dependent on the ideas that's going to be generated outside of Europe. We're not alone in that position of getting more dependent on others, but I think it's I think it's a, a, a development which sits uncomfortably with more um, simplistic and perhaps raw concepts of economic power and what that entails in terms of, of how we formulate policies. Second point, technological the, the technology frontier. Um, there are lots of things to say about the technology frontier and how uh, Europe positioned itself there. One obvious point is that Europe is not a unitary phenomenon. There is huge variation within Europe uh, when it comes to position to the uh, to the frontier. Uh, what we can see, however, of course, is that uh, sort of the the usual comfortable position that Europe used to have, at least that Western Europe used to have, uh, of being at the frontier of most technological change through modern history, that's something which is now beginning to change. Um, we can see when we measure different technologies and Europe's uh, position uh, with the frontier that it's, it's positioned itself good in some technologies, not good in other technologies. And there is more variation which of course leads to uh, leads to questions about um, how we were going to access uh, technologies. If we have shrinking capabilities of being at the frontier across the board, we need to think about other ways of accessing technologies and making sure that they can be used in European economy. Um, if we look at endowments here, um, and especially endowments in terms of, of uh, human capital and uh, highly qualified human capital. It's, it's a pretty good picture that comes out when you, when you measure European situation with others. Uh, for instance, if you look at um, output of AI research, for instance, or AI graduates, Europe is sort of in a largely in the same position as America. Uh, uh, as China, when it comes to AI, since China is is is, is very good there, um, it gets a little bit less good when you begin to look at the intensities and start to measure, for instance, the use of AI um, in different economic organizations at firm level, and you try to understand sort of how how these endowments are being used in the economy. Um, we see, for instance, that there is a net outflow of AI human capital in Europe, um, which of course conforms to a, a pattern of agglomeration where, um, where human, cat human capital also going to uh, uh, most likely uh, uh, have a net migrant flow which, which moves into the regions where, uh, which attracts uh, more human capital than other regions and more investment in other regions, for instance. But the, the, I think the big point that I want to come here is, is uh, we have good performance on some indicators, but the, the point is that others are running faster than Europe is. And, and this, is, this is one of the challenges that we have. A third point is on the secular shift in trade uh, from goods to services and new patterns of globalization that we see. Globalization isn't dead. Globalization, I think, right now is, is pretty much th thriving. It's just that it's very different from the globalization that we used to analyze in the past. It's not goods driven. It's not necessarily traditional type of trade flows. But when you look at the, the uh, linkage, linkages of exchange, when you look at, at firm level, how companies uh, work across the borders today, you're going to find an enormously strong uh, pattern of globalization going on. But it's not in, it's not in goods, it's in, 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 in other sectors. Uh, given Europe's high industrial profile, um, it's it's a secular shift that that Europe hasn't really yet found a way uh, in order to manage, uh, leading to Europe to maintain sort of its its strong trading power status that that it's had um, throughout uh, uh, the era of of industry driven. Uh, output and industry-driven exchange. So we, for instance, can see that if you take something like uh, an indicator like the extra-regional trade intensity of Europe, it's it's a gradual decline here, which which largely uh, can be explained by uh, by the the secular shift in trade and moving from 
from from industry into into services. These are three um, um, uh, factors that I think are important to to take into account whether the type of analysis we want to do on power versus plenty. Um, and I think to me, it leads me um, to sort of the basically my, which is my final point on productivity growth and how these different things um, relate to the relative performance of, of uh, economic regions vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, this is a simple chart with data from European Central Bank and from the US Fed on, on uh, sources of productivity growth and, of course, size of productivity growth between um, uh, uh, Euro Area 12 and United States. Um, there are lots of things to say about, about uh, differences in patterns and differences in levels, but one obvious one is, of course, on TFP. Um, and, and why we have seen uh, 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 sort of a TFP contribution to, to productivity that is significantly smaller than, than in the United States. And this is something, of course, which has been consistent over a long period of time. And consistent, consistent variations in productivity contributions over a long period of time tend to lead to very significant changes in, in GDP per capita over time as well. And, and uh, this is what I like to end. And this is where sort of our work has been uh, ended up in um, focusing on, on policies that is going to generate productivity growth. Um, for economists like us, we know definitely the role that productivity growth plays for long-term economic development. But the other point related to uh, the analysis of power and the analysis to have economic power in order to deal with new type of challenges in the future, uh, productivity growth is going to be of tremendous importance also there. It's what is going to lead to a strong economy and a strong economy will be able to command more authority and more influence globally in the future. So, Harald, I'm going to stop there and, and then I, I'll, I'll put myself into your safe hands. Thank you very much, Frederick. Uh, thanks also for time management. We, we still have more than half an hour for, for discussion. Um, just a reminder to the audience, uh, please put your questions and comments in the Q&A section here of the Zoom, um, Zoom video call. And uh, so please participate in our discussion. So so maybe, maybe I start with the first question. Um, more related to your slides, and then obviously later on, we can also talk about just very current uh, developments, given that today we, we hear the State of the Union address. Um, so, so maybe just start first with, um, um, so, so I'm, I'm, I very much th like this idea that we now need to talk much more about this uh, prosperity versus power issue and, Jake, and bringing Jacob Weiner back somehow because my impression is that we might have been too ignorant about the power issues over the last, let's say, 30 years with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And my, my first question would be, how would you relate those three uh, issues that you mentioned with respect to, to, to competitiveness, the, the relative economic decline of the European Union, uh, the technolo technological frontier story, as well as the shift in in trade to services trade in general, in in this um, in this um, kind of uh, conflicting targets or conflicting goals issue of prosperity versus power. Because my impression would be that most of those actually, maybe with the exception of technological issues. I'm more concerned about prosperity, right? So the question is whether our our pie of the cake gets smaller or larger in terms of overall value added in the world, and and also with respect to to shifts in in trade. If we're successful and competitive in in service trade, then this will bring more prosperity, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, they will bring more prosperity, um, but I, I, I think they are also of tremendous importance if you if you want to think about it through the lenses of economic power. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, a, a first and obvious one, of course, is that Europe can do a lot of things in order to slow the pace of relative decline, and the the more that we can keep up. Uh, a significant share of the global market or of global consumption or of global uh, trade, 
the more powerful we're going to be. Um, the more uh, other parts of the world are going to be dependent on us. Mm-hmm. And 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 I think this is the point, which is that that what you do when you are powerful is that you create natural alliances and you create national friendships, which you do through trade and other forms of cross-border flows and cross-border exchange. The fact that others want to integrate with you because you have something to contribute. And and I think that goes both on issues about sort of what share of the pie that you represent, but sort of you can break that down to many other factors. You can break it down to how attractive is it for foreign students in other parts of the world to come to Europe in order to get a master's degree, get a PhD, continue to start uh, or sort of start a career here and and use that human capital in Europe rather than anywhere else. Uh, you can break it down into what type of linkages that are going to be built at firm level with everything from licensing uh, exchanges that takes place between firms in different parts of the world to how attractive is it to form uh, dependencies on technologies that will be generated in in Europe? Um, so all these things matter. And of course, around that, you can create um, uh, a network of policies and a network of agreements that is going to help you to sustain uh, an influence um, on other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we learned, uh, for instance, now, uh, an old or relearned the lesson um, that the economy is not everything when it comes to conflict. I mean, we have imposed significant sanctions, for instance, against Russia. And there's been an underlying assumption with these sanctions that they're going to inflict so much economic pain that is going to change um, uh, uh, how a foreign regime decides about uh, going to war with other countries or not, or stopping that war. Well, we have learned an old lesson, which is that economic sanctions themselves uh, aren't enough in order to bring this around. But we do know uh, that the dense linkages that you create through different type of economic flows between countries, the the patterns of dependencies that you generate will have a very strong impact on a lot of countries in order to conform their policies to be more in tune and more friendly with those that are powerful. Um, I think this is this is sort of one one very important lessons we've learned throughout history. Uh, and of course, it's become even more sanguine or more important as as uh, the density and the economic value of those linkages have grown over time. Um, so that would be my first point that sort of we still um, uh, in a process where, these things matter for economic power. The other thing you you pointed to is, of course, that um, uh, after the collapse of of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism, um, there was, at least in some part, sort of a a pretty rosy-cheeked assumption about about peace, um, uh, about non-conflict, and a world which was gradually going to converge to uh, different type of of institutions that we would associate with liberal market democracies. Mm-hmm. Um, that wasn't correct, um, and and that has led a lot of people to want to reevaluate um, that whole paradigm itself about the importance of cross border exchange or the importance of relying on multilateral institutions in order to. Uh, to deal with frictions and problems that exist, um, sort of a, a paradigm which is about, you know, America first or um, uh, or about uh, using industrial policy in a way which is which is very much sort of beggar thy neighbor uh, in its in its entire approach. So even if there is even if there could be sort of a strong case that we need to be a bit more uh, realistic about the world. Uh, and especially be realistic about certain parts of the world, we still have to acknowledge the fact that the majority of the world is still a world which is conforming to uh, 
European Western type of, of institutions that like to see more integration with Europe, like to see more integration with, with other like-minded countries in the world that are broadly friendly and that we can definitely use for, to build uh, linkages, alliances, also in economic terms, that's going to generate both prosperity and, and power. And I mean, to give you an example how, how this can work, I mean, if you think, for instance, about satellite communication and its importance during uh, Russia's war on Ukraine, um, and think about all the money that the Chinese regime and others have spent into trying to find ways to easily disconnect Europe and, and America from its satellite communication capabilities in the event of conflicts. Um, suddenly comes uh, a private entrepreneur called Elon Musk with a company called Starlink, and he's using a distributed satellite communication technology, which makes it sort of practically worthless in order to try a sat uh, attack a satellite somewhere because it's a distributed system. So it's just going to operate through other system. And there are so many of them that you can spend a lifetime trying to shoot down Elon Musk's different satellites, if, if that's what you wanted to do. These satellites, well, they do include a lot of kit from China. So China may be sort of the, the, the country that have been trying to manage the role of satellite communication in the event of war uh, and what they believe to be a threat from, from Western powers more than others. Uh, and they may have benefited from sort of the economic globalization that, that catered to uh, the type of products that China uh, uh, want, could produce and could use in order to start to create a different path for, to prosperity. But it's also the fact that they their technologies and their economic and human capital are being used in order to create a distributed, highly multilateralized form of technology uh, that is eroding their capabilities to manage conflicts with Europe and, 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 and America. And I, I think sort of in, in that little example, you're going to find a lot of different uh, aspects that you can aggregate up and think about in macro terms, how interlinkages, how dependencies help to shape different type of outcomes that that in why in one way or not will be influential when when other countries are considering economic power and and what the distribution of economic power is in the world. Thank you. Uh, maybe, maybe just just directly related to to what you said about Western values, and uh, and that there are still many countries that want to engage in, in in good relationships with us. Just just a question out of curiosity, and due to the fact that your your think tank is located in Brussels, so that you for sure have much better insights in the Brussels institutions. Um, in, in your opinion, did we know the problems that you mentioned and how we should should uh, deal with what we see in the world right now from a policy point of view and from the perspective of the European Union? Do you think that policymakers at the EU level uh, already are set the stage for this? So are we aware of what we have to do? And the second question related to this are we really so homogeneous within the European Union in terms of values and where we want to go in the future that it's just a monolithic block in a sense that we can easily, um, easily in relative terms, move forward with the strategy and also looking into this power aspect? Just I'm thinking about the conflicts with Hungary or Poland, for example. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Um, and um, there is variation. There is variation in institutional uh, performance. There, is, there are variations in corruption. There are variations in in the independence of judiciary, uh, the extent to which that you have um, variety uh, of media, of plural plurality of of opinions that are uh, circulating in your society. That's for sure. Um, my expectation or my thinking is that I think we have sufficient convergence on the broad strategic issues in order for Brussels to basically okay. move forward if it wants to. Uh, notwithstanding uh, 
um, frictions in different parts. I think those frictions are are uh, not significant in light of of sort of the bigger shifts that are already taking place. Um, I think you, uh, as your question pointed to, I think we may have a couple of issues uh, when it comes to sort of the cognitive or the knowledge aspects of understanding what it is that we want to do. Um, I would definitely say that there is not uh, anchored in the EU environment a sufficient understanding what's required in order to lift productivity growth. Um, I think there is um, um, uh, a sense of of frustration and um, perhaps even bewilderment in trying to figure out how do you do that mm. uh, uh, in light of other changes that are taking place. And these changes may be demography, uh, shrinking labor forces, difficulties of generating more uh, uh, high-skilled uh, human capital, um how do you how what do you what do you need to do and how can you from the eu influence policies if you if you want for instance to improve the university environment in europe um the fact that uh right now there aren't that many universities that that come in uh, on any significant place when you begin to rank say the 50 best technological universities in the world or whatever type of ranking that you want to use and you can say, well, these rankings may be um, problematic. They may have uh, conceptual errors built into them. That may be true, but it's still uh, a perfect obvious fact that that uh, when you look at at sort of investments in the university sector, the capabilities they have in building up the infrastructure for uh, life sciences research for uh, for um, uh, sort of doing having capacities in astronomy and etc that we are we're not where we should be and and of course these these are very difficult issues to deal with and and the eu itself is is constructed for a different type of reality it's it's constructed for a reality where we basically say the contribution that we can give to uh, prosperity in the EU and to safety in the EU is going to ban producing barriers internally within the single market. And mm. while that may still be important, we're talking about also um, a couple of other factors related to human capital, related to other endowments, where it's just very difficult, I think, for Brussels to figure out, so where do we fit into this, this policy mix of, of that probably will be necessary in order to in order to change the 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 pattern of growth in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, talking about policy mix, I would like to bring in one of the a first question from the audience. Audience, audience. Um, well, obviously there is an elephant in the room also with respect to productivity growth. Is technological change in terms of bringing the economy to a CO two neutral economy, right? So, and then Barbara is asking which gen chances do you see for a stronger focus on sustainability like green economy research trade in order to adopt to sometimes catastrophic effects of man-made climate change yeah i i i mean my my broad take on the issue is that i think we have um, we have already on a path of change which i think is strong um we can have opinions about that it should be stronger, that it should move faster. Um, but I think it's 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 strong enough in order to uh, continue to change the incentive structures of societies in order to move in order to more sustain, sustainable sources of economic output and to speed up the structural change that means for the economy. Um, there will be policies that contradict with that trend both at the eu level and at different in different member states but i think the the the, the pattern of change has already or sort of the the, the structural change has already been fundamental 
Uh, I would like to see it more, but I think it's it's something which sustained itself and now has also generated its own economic engines in order to sort of point to more changes to come down the line. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, now, um, I would have a second question from the audience that is very closely related to to your presentation on productivity growth, actually, on your comparison the US and, and, and the U12. Uh, it's from Manfred Chekolin from the ministry. First of all, he thanks you a lot for the thought-provoking presentation. And then he states an hypothesis and wants to, to know your opinion on this. He, he's saying uh, the lower European growth rates seem to, to a significant degree reflect the preferences of European voters who attach relatively higher values to work-life balance and lower work hours than to increase consumption. For European politicians, the question does seem to be not so much how to increase economic growth, but how to avoid negative spillovers from lower growth rates. Is that a realistic option? Is it possible to delink innovation and productivity growth from economic growth? It's a difficult one, I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a difficult one, and I mean, I, I, it, it's one it's it's one that we've been uh, confronted with. Uh, in different parts of, of not just sort of long economic history, but also in recent economic history, um, we had a similar type of preoccupation about things in, for instance, the uh, the 1970s and the early 1980s, when it it, it worked on the different um, titles or names in different countries, but sort of the Anglo-Saxon uh, name for it was, of course, managed decline. Um, mm -hmm. which is about sort of finding a way for us to make the decline uh, uh, manageable in terms of, of calibrating what we wanted to achieve in, in that work-life balance with expectations for, uh, for prosperity increases, expectations for what type of, of quality improvements we could see in goods, uh, what type of quality improvements in services like healthcare and education, um, and 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 that was a pretty strong uh, sort of thought at the time uh, in in many different countries of 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 accepting the fact sort of that uh, there is nothing that can change here, which is going to make uh, a palpable difference to the levels of, of of productivity growth. So we just need to think through the consequences of it. Um, I mean, we are there right now in, in quite many type of policy issues. I mean, one obvious one is on pensions, for instance, um, a really, really difficult one. Uh, another one is on, on, um, on how we... Um, find ways to reallocate public resources in order to make sure um, we give more to the prioritized ones than to to the less prioritized ones etc I, mean, I I think I would I would sort of begin to challenge the assumption behind it um, and and the first one the first thing I would say sort of is that the period when we started to delink productivity growth, from longer working hours. This is a pretty long time ago. Um, um, the, the period when we delinked uh, productivity growth or GDP growth from resources and more intensive resource use was also a pretty long time ago. I mean, it's a different variations you're going to find um, in different European countries, but I know from several European countries that have done these analyses basically showing that in terms, for instance, of, of energy or in terms of carbon emissions per every unit of new growth that you generated, it's it's been decoupling. Um, it's changed a bit now after the after the war, probably since we have seen a um, a different use, use of different energy sources again. But 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 I think sort of the main general point I want to make sort of is that is that uh, I I don't I don't think it's it's sort of a change or a different preference, for instance, in America on the work-life balance that these preferences have changed over the 30, let's say the last 30 years in America, which mm -hmm. has led them to speed ahead over Europe. I think that preference is largely the same as it was 30 years ago. 
uh, to the extent it's a change is that America has become a little bit more like Europe than than it used to be in the past. Uh, the difference, of course, is on 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 something else, and that may not be less problematic or less controversial to deal with in economy. And of course, it's about structural economic change. And it's about the, the, the degree to which that you are prepared to allow that change to happen. Mm-hmm. And that change, of course, have become a bit more controversial and more difficult now, because if we look at structural economic change from basically the 50 years that followed the Second World War, it was a pretty easy structural change. What would what the, the way it was managed was to a large extent by changing uh, the product offering from companies. Um, you do you you did have companies that went bust or that didn't survive long term competition. Um, you had changes uh, in 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 the competitiveness of sectors when more trade opened up or when technology generated more capacities to trade, etc. I mean, I'll 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 use to grow up in in a part of the world that was very strong in textiles and textile production. Mm-hmm. That's that's not anymore. Um, sure. um, um, so so these changes have happened, but for a long period of time, uh, at firm level, structural change you could accommodate at that firm level by changing the, the 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 your product offering, and the structural change on the labor side was also pretty easy because it was just normally retraining on the job that was required in order for you to move from one industrial job to another industrial job. Now it's a different pattern uh, that, of course, uh, is 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 change, sort of needs to happen for that change uh, to become uh, more visible in the TFP levels. Um, so thinking around that issue on 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 churn in labor markets, on churn in firms, um, and we may not need to start with the most controversial one. We can start with the more easy ones, which of course is to, to find policies that is going to distribute productivity more evenly uh, across the firm distribution. That would be a sort of a a pretty obvious one and where policies could do a lot in order to help given the sort of significant productivity variations that that exist between firms within a sector within a country. We can do uh, a lot um, when it comes to just generating more capabilities for market entry and for for sort of new firm growth, um, uh, not thinking about. So, so do you have? Do you, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Do you have competition policy in mind for that? So, um, well, for entry, of course, I would say so. But in terms of what, what would be your policy suggestion for redistributing productivity? So, would you end having patents or stuff like that? So, would you open up innovative technologies to more firms, or what would be the suggestion here? Well, I mean, I think I think you can you, you can consider many of them, um, but I think they are going to only lead to changes in the margin unless you deal with the bigger ones, and the bigger ones are going to be about labor supply. Um, so if you want if you want to do sort of perhaps the most important thing in order to change uh, uh, the firm distribution of productivity is to increase labor supply, uh, increase the amount of of human capital that is going to be available to companies. Mm-hmm. I mean. If you can't if you can't deal with that, all the other stuff is not going to lead to much change at all. So, so I see at the end of the day, a lot of your suggestions come back to research and development and universities, human capital education um, as, as an important structural factor for, uh, well, obviously a, a rich economic area in the world that is not very uh, natural resource uh, abundant, I would say. Um, so, so talents. Yeah, yeah. That that I, I think that, that that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but maybe uh, also given the time, because time is running, we only have five minutes left. So maybe maybe just to conclude with the last question and also picking this up. Here is um, so as I mentioned before today, we had the State of the Union address from Commission President uh, von der Leyen, and then. Um, I, I've just wrote a bit about it, but I'm, I had not the opportunity to listen to the whole address. So I don't know what I don't know whether you had the opportunity to. But in general, would you say that uh, 
the European Union is ready to go this way. So in terms of understanding what is crucial, what type of policies we do need to have to manage the decline in the way you described before. So in terms of looking more in qualitative aspects of economic growth instead of just numbers. So by optimization and stuff like that, so which would help us to, to manage this obviously uh, much more successful. So do you think we are on the right track in terms of the understanding of the European Union top level policy making? Well, I, th I think it's beginning to change, and I think you could see that also in 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 von der Leyen's uh, State of the Union speech today. Um, I mean, it's it's I mean that speech itself, pretty obviously, uh, has to be anchored in light of what's happened over the past couple of years, mm. with the pandemic and the war, and given sort of the paramount importance of both for uh, for what sort of the European Union has been trying to do what her commission has been trying to do so so i think that's 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 where we started and and i think she puts a lot of emphasis on these issues pretty obviously uh, i think you can see that she's also doing her bits uh, in order to try to move the needle a bit when it comes to issues about growth productivity and competitiveness um i think we've seen that over some time now that there is a a, a, a uh, and a new interest uh, also pushed by many member states on trying to get these issues back on the agenda of being a bit frustrated with the slow pace uh, of, of change uh, that has been visible in their economies, um, that they would need also assistance from the EU, both in terms perhaps of structural changes and sometimes also in terms of public finances in order to to make sure that that change can go faster. Um, and I think on, on both issues, my the way I read von der Leyen is basically, it's in that direction that she's pointing to as well. Then there are a couple of, of big issues to deal with here. Um, the issue where there has been most activity on the part of the EU over the last two years is firstly on industrial policy and on providing resources in order to generate uh, more change in certain type of technologies. Um, I think the jury is very much still out on whether this is a good approach or not a good approach. If the if the sort of overall strategy here is going to be helpful in order to generate the changes in technology and the changes in 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 firm uh, uh, productivity that we want to see, and the other one is on regulation. Um, and if it's something that the von der Leyen uh, commission is going to be associated with, associated with it's the arrival of a lot of new regulation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's perfectly obvious that the commission doesn't know if it's calibrating its regulatory agenda in a good way. When you look at many of the sort of very much uh, uh, sort of important regulatory initiatives that have been taking, uh, it's been quite um, discouraging to see how little time and resources they have spent in order to try to figure out what will be the economic consequences of these regulations. Um, to what extent will a lot of regulation, for instance, on data, on, on digital business models, to what extent are, is that going to have an impact on the European economy? And right now, I mean, we are basically flying in the dark on these issues. We don't know. Um, but the, the underlying underlying paradigm which is there which i think sits a bit awkwardly uh, is that the more you regulate things in europe for instance on ai the more it's going to be used in europe and the more europe is going to position itself better vis-a-vis -vis other regions of the world i think i think that's that's a proposition uh, which is difficult to square with what we know about about relative competitive patterns in the economy so Hopefully, we are going to see also on these two issues a bit more thinking for the next commission and thinking also about, all right, perhaps it's it's not an agenda for changing what they've done now. But, but I mean, my, my thinking when it comes to policy is, is basically taking a portfolio approach to it, as you would do when, you, when you're investing, you know, your 
your savings or when you're planning for your pension, which is that. So if you have a portfolio of policies and you, you want to be more restrictive than other economies in the world on, on a number of issues, and that may be fine. It may be may have sort of very little impact on the total aggregate uh, performance if you in the same portfolio will will then make it easier on some other issues. Um, and I think sort of finding that portfolio effect and understanding the balances between different policies, I think that will be a challenge for the next commission if it wants to be helpful in, in generating uh, more growth in Europe uh, over the next over the next decade. Thank you very much, Frederick. I think this is a, a nice proposal for the future on how to move forward. Uh, maybe just very briefly, because Barbara had another question on, on whether you would uh, think that the Commission should do more impact assessments when they start regulatory projects. Obviously, your question would be yes, if I understand you correctly from your uh, reply to the last question. Uh, so uh, having have a, a look at the time, I feel we need to close now, but before uh, uh, before doing so, just a very brief uh, remark about our next uh, event in the FIW series. I think that fits perfectly what Frederick was saying a lot is on next Tuesday, September um, September the 16th, no, sorry, the 19th um, at 2 p.m. We have a presentation of a study that is called Skills for 2030 uh, in order to to uh, reach the sustainable development goal. So it's a study on what kind of skills will be necessary uh, to be to be di distributed until 2030 among people in, in Austria. So I think this perfectly fits in the education story that Frederick uh, was mentioning. Uh, now, having said that, so we would be very happy if you could tune in for this presentation of the study. Uh, and with this, I would like to, to wish all of you a nice evening and once more, thank you very much, Frederick, for, for joining us today. And I'm uh, very much uh, looking forward to talking to you in the future again. All the best from Vienna and see you soon. Thank you. Bye.